I am woman, hear me roar. I know you want to hold on to the woman I was before, but I'm not her and she isn't me. I'm now standing in the ashes of who I used to be. Loss on the left and heartbreak on the right. But God knew I was his soldier for the fight. Some don't want me to forget the mistakes already done. But God said for my sins, he gave his only son. So your gossip, opinions, and lack of support. I have learned to use that as motivation for improvement and not take it to heart. Don't be selfish to think that for you to go up, you must keep me down. Because my sister, we all deserve to wear a crown. Don't knock my hand when I reach out for you. I know many have done you wrong and now you only trust a few. I want to see you healed, delivered, and set free. I can't say I love my sister and watch her remain in captivity. You are woman. Let them hear you roar. Because you are not the her you were before. That was Shaped Woman by myself, Everett Maxine. Hey, y'all. It's her Friday, and I have another amazing guest. Please remember to like, follow, and most importantly, share. Today I have with us Miss Jocelyn Washington. Can you let everybody know where you're from and how old you are? Oh, hello. I'm from Bay City, Texas. I'm 57 years old. Um, Would you like to share how many children you have? Sure. I have three adult children. Uh, ages 40, 34, and 31. So, growing up, kids learn a lot of things from their parents. What do you think you've learned, if anything, from your children? I think that I've learned so much from my children, but most of all, I learned at a later age, uh, because my children are pushing me, uh, Mm -hmm. that you're never too old to follow your dreams. Right, right, right. Even at 57, you can still start over and, you know, go to school and do more for yourself. Right. That That is absolutely true. You, you know, um, I used to believe if things weren't accomplished at a certain date, at a certain time, but the older I'm getting, the more wisdom I'm getting that God's timeline is not the same as ours. And so if you still have breath in your body, you're still in your right mind, you can still pursue goals. Like we should have um, ever changing goals. Like you, you reach that, you set a couple goals, you reach them. And then, you know, throughout your lifetime, you're still going to be setting goals. So that is, that is, that is really good. Yes, um, so I started this podcast July, 2019. And, um, <laughs> one of the most interesting things, because being one of your daughters, uh, we, we went to school together and um, we were in junior college together for a little while. And she shared with me that um, you, re- you you had told her about the podcast and um, uh, another mutual acquaintance. So when it um, first began, you know, what about the podcast caught your attention or interested you most? The thing that caught my attention the most was your transparency uh, about your sexual abuse, about your suicidal attempts, uh, your past marriage, and that led up to divorce. Uh, That really touched me. But most of all, going from, uh, you did mention going from mentally ill to mentally healed. And that just blew me away because I was like, I have never heard that before. You know, most people that are mentally ill, they stay mentally ill, the remain, you know, all their life. But to hear that, it just touched me on so many levels. Right. Especially, you know, dealing with some issues myself. Well, what where that comes from is um, I, the therapist, I've been in therapist for years and I share that um, often. And one of the things that my therapist believes, because she is a faith believer, is that there are no absolutes when it comes to Christ. And, you know, we pray for people when they're physically, you know, ill and we believe in their healing. So why don't we do the same for those that are mentally ill? Yes. 
Yeah. So um, it's possible, you know, um, and, and one of the things why I began to do this was because when I lost my mom, I see a lot of people, um, they sit in grief, should I say? And yes. I think sometimes we think if we hold on to grief or we stay in that place of mourning, that means we love those people more. But it's, we're very capable of moving on with our lives and still respecting their legacy. And like like with depression, I see a lot of people on my news feed that say, oh, I'm depressed, I'm depressed, I'm depressed. You can come out of those things, so you don't have to wallow in it. You don't have to sit in it. You know, it takes, takes for me, it took talking to someone, um, a, um, you know, anxiety, those things, you know, it, it's, we, we, it's manageable. Um, but yeah, therapy is my, uh, my, my go-to. <laughs> I, I, I talk about that a, a lot. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of times in our, um, communities where we're from, I think a lot of people would benefit from therapy. Um, I know we haven't talked about this, but, but what do you think our culture is with therapy? Do you think they'd be beneficial? Or do you think we're progressing more towards welcoming therapy into our lives? I think that therapy is very, that it would be beneficial uh, in our culture. I think that a lot of people are moving toward therapy, but there are still some people that are afraid to go because of stigma. You know, over the right. years, you say, well, if you're trying to seek therapy, you're crazy or there's something wrong with you, something missing. But I definitely feel that uh, therapy is a good thing for us. everybody should have therapy. You know, I saw therapy myself. Uh, I've been in therapy for the last 10 years, and it has really helped me tremendously. Well, congratulations to you. I feel like it takes a lot of courage to go to therapist. I mean, it, it really, you know, it, it took me when I first went, it took me about three months before I actually opened up. And I'm a talker. But um, once I did, it, 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 it changed my whole world. Um, right now... With everything that's going on, we're using a lot of technology. And although it has its advantages, you know, what do you think having all the cell phone, the YouTube, all the instant stuff has taken away from us? I think it took the person-to-person -person interaction away. Instead of us uh, seeing each other in person, we're talking on uh, FaceTime or we're texting. A lot of people don't, they would rather text than to pick up the phone and call you. Uh, they don't want to come over. They can, you know, see you on the phone or whatever. And it's taken away from social interaction. True, true. And I'm guilty. If somebody, I, I, I'd rather somebody text me than call me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then there's some people be like, don't be sending me these long text messages. Yeah, I'm guilty. Like, I don't, I don't, but the FaceTime, I haven't, um, with therapy, we started having to do that because of COVID, but yeah. I don't do a lot of FaceTime with people, usually because, I guess because I'm very, it sounds weird for me to say I'm a private person and I share, share my story all over the world, but I am a very private person and I just think, like, in that moment, something could happen or something could go on. And here you are live with this person. I don't know. It's just my thought. <laughs> I start, I think crazy thoughts. That's true. <laughs> and I, one of the things I think about, you know, with technology, like kids have a lot of games. And, like, I, I didn't do a lot of outside activities coming up, but we created our own games and, and learning. Like, we had actual encyclopedias in our hand and dictionaries and things like that. And I feel like they're missing all of that. They just get the video games and the cell phones and all the instant stuff. And it, it's just not the same. Yes, that is so true. They miss, I think about my grandchildren, my granddaughter, um, hopscotch, jacks. Oh, yes. And ring, all the good things that I enjoy doing when I was, you know, young and coming up. 
they don't have, you know, access to those things. No, not at all. They wouldn't even know what those things are. <laughs> they, somebody posted the other day that um, you complaining stepping on Legos. What about a ja- what about jacks? Yeah, and I was like, wow, I forgot about those marbles and just ah, uh, man, take me back to the age. Yes. So we're in a um, right now we're we um about empowering the people of color, um, especially now that the VP is a woman of color. What do you see um, of your view as the past and the present women of color? Especially like, you know, I mean, even, well, I could say as a whole, I want you to say with just the younger generation. Well, I think the past women of color, those women were phenomenal. But uh, most of them, they took care of the house while the men went out and worked. They were the main providers, the, the, the husbands, the men, while the women took care of the children, took care of most of the housework and the things around the house. Okay. So do you, do, do you miss that or do you think, do you like um, how things have gravitated with, you know, both spouses working and things like that. I like the way that it is now because it takes two most times to make ends meet. Um, I like the fact that both uh, husband and wife can work uh, and also share the responsibilities in the house. And a lot of that is taking place now is shared responsibilities. Right, right. I know when I was a little old school, when I was still married, I wanted to be able to cook for my husband, which now things are a lot different. People can order DoorDash or whatever, and they good. But um, I was a little old school, my thoughts. I always wanted to be able to be home, cook for my husband, try to clean the house. Um, but I do like that women are getting educated. They are holding down their own jobs. And, like, if they want to get married, it's a choice. It's not just like, oh, I must settle down. But, you know, it, it's not that stigma anymore that you got to settle down and get married by a certain age. So I, I'm, I'm loving it. <laughs> That's true. So I've known you over quite a f- few years. But um, what is something no one knows or only a few people know about Jocelyn? Very few people know that I suffer insomnia. I have most of my life. I'm up all hours of the night. Uh, There are a few people that do know that I suffer from insomnia and I do not sleep at night. And uh, they seem to call me uh, for just a listening ear or to talk about their problems or whatever. If I do fall asleep, I'm quick to jump up and be right, you know, 100% 100% there for them. And uh, I've also found it to be a great tool for ministry, you know, for my prayer life. I've always had a prayer life, always loved to pray. My mother was a prayer warrior. And so uh, I used to listen to her pray when I was a little girl. And um, something about that prayer connected, you know, with me. And as I grow older, I found prayer to be my go to. For everything. I prayed about everything. And I prayed as I got older, I would pray for anybody in the grocery store, uh, at school, wherever. And so it became a part of my life, a big part of my life. And um, so. Um, yeah, I miss I miss um, Mother Deloach and her prayers. Um, I've been thinking about her lately, which was your mother's sister. Um, I've been thinking a lot about her lately with everything that is going on in the world that the prayer warriors we had back in the day, it is very, yeah. we still have people praying, but the older generation, the way they prayed for us and the way, and the way they've gone before God, that we really have to get to that place in our life because the evil that is going on is really on the rise right now. Yes, it is. It, it, it's it's devastating, but you know we we 
And I, I love the, I love that, um, that was my first thought when you said you, the insomnia, that even though it might be a struggle for you, God can use that as an opportunity to be a listener, listening ear for somebody, um, when other people are sleeping and, and you're doing exactly that. So, um, praise God. So COVID coronavirus, I don't know if you've been affected by it at all. Have you? Yes, of course. I've had some family members actually that have uh, contracted COVID-19 um, more than once. So it in, in, in the town where, we, where I'm from in Bay City, um, the numbers are very high with COVID-19. We've had some people to die from COVID, some prominent, you know, a very prominent person that uh, we all knew. And so it has really been devastating. And it's still in effect. So we still have to take safety precautions, stay inside. I just about have cabin fever from staying inside. <laughs> but we have to do what we have to do to stay safe. Right. I know that my, I myself have been put on quarantine twice, um, once in May and most recently in August. And for me, um, I, I'm asthmatic, so my immune system is compromised. So both times it was negative, but it just, um, with me, I also work in a hospital. So with me working in a hospital, not knowing what you're going to be around, I have had to be extra cautious. And mm -hmm. so I can't, I wasn't a party goer, but I'd go out and have dinner with my friends in public. So I've tried to not do that or crowded areas or go in the grocery store. And so it's kind of led to like a little like, stir crazy because it's like I miss socializing with people you know and then um I'm an essential employee and I kind of feel bad for a lot of people right now because they've lost their job um their, their parents have kids at home because they're teaching them virtually and that can be extra stress and then you know even with the job loss some of these people are getting evicted so it's like COVID is really doing a uh, number on people, not only financially, but mentally. Yes, that is so true. I feel like, you know, uh, there are people that uh, are being evicted and they don't, they can't find the resources. The government has tried to help in some of the communities, some of the, like Houston, I saw where they're, uh, they have assistance that is helping some of the people, but they can't help everybody. So some people are being, you know, they're falling between the cracks right. and they're still about, you know, being evicted and not having a place to go. So, um, recently, um, you know, um, we were supposed to, um, I sent the, the invitation to interview you and in, in the, um, last couple of weeks, um, family has dealt with some loss. Um, most recently, um, there was a, another uh, murder in Bay City, which is also uh, my hometown. Um, I, I think I've lost track of the number. It might be number fifth or number six, but it's just each, each life loss, even though I didn't know most of the young men really hurt, um, yeah. The most, the most recently one we 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 knew. What yeah. do you think it's going to take for these young men to start um, stop using these guns? What I would like to see, I would like to see um, the mothers go. I mean, reach out to the churches because I've always looked to the church for guidance. And I feel like uh, they should, you know, if they would look to the churches, reach out to the churches in our community. We have several churches in our community. Find a church that has a ministry or a program that can reach these young men, these young women, and help to bring them, you know, help to reform them. Yeah. Sit them down to them, you know, even uh, the parents, you know. Uh, I'd like to see them, you know, be able to sit down and talk to them, find out what it is 
that's triggering them, making them think that they have to turn to gun violence. You know, if it's anger, if it's resentment, rejection, depression, whatever it may be, you know, I, I would really like to see that happen because uh, there is it, it's getting out of hand. There's too much of it going on. And like you say, uh, it's in a place where we all know each other. These people know each other. And right. that's the that's really heartbreaking to see people killing each other that they know. Friends, you know, sometimes relatives. And uh, it's really devastating. I think it's a, a devastation to our community and the community as a whole. I'd like to see them come together and implement a plan to help these young people, to help to redirect them. Right. Yeah, because I, I, even now, I'm trying to, to, to stay composed. Um, but it's like you see everything going on in the world, in the nation, and it's like my community back home has has an issue with itself. And it's like, and, I, and I, I've shared on Facebook that demonic spirits are real, dark spirits are real. Um, there. You know, and, and it's not like a, a spirit is a spirit. It's not like I'm saying anybody is a horrible individual. I'm not saying they can't learn from their mistakes. Um, but it's it's just we have to seek God. Like you said, they really need to seek God. They need to seek the church. They yeah. they and not be so I think on both ends, the, the church can't condemn the parent. And the parent has to be willing to receive the help. That's right. Re- willing to receive the help because, you know, so we don't, because it just really, uh, where we're in a position in this, 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 this climate where we're saying black lives matter and people are, are starting to see the talent and, and the value of, um, the creativity of the black mind, and here we are, these black males back to back are leaving this earth, and, and it just it, it really it really baffles me. It really does. That is so true, and uh, like you said, um, spirits spirits are transferable. You know, um, we can't count out spirituality because it it plays a big part in our lives. It, it takes God to get us from where we are to where we're going. It's right. going to take, it's going to take guidance, uh, redirecting. It's going to take, you know, ministering. It's going to take counseling, um, therapy in order for them to get where they need to be. It's, it's really hard. You know, I don't think any young person wants to just be lost. You know, so I feel like with the right help, they can make it, you know, back to where they need to be. Right. And that I, I, I brought up the church because the church has always in our culture been the go to for everything. When we had family members sick, we called the pastor. When somebody died, we called the pastor up. Uh, a child got in trouble and went to jail or facing prison time, we call the pastor. And it still stands today. You know, the church is still there for us, but we just have to reach out. You know, sometimes we have to just reach out and let them know our needs. Right. Because the help is there. The help is out there for us. And I would like to see more of it. People, more parents taking advantage of you know, calling on clergy to be able to help, calling on the spiritual uh, leaders to be able to help with our community. Because I, that, you know, they're, that's what they're there for. And they don't mind helping. We just have to go to them and, you know, let them know what we need from them. I know um, coming up, one for, for me, I, I, I constantly thank my village because there were a lot of people that have, helped me along the way because my mother was a single mom and she had to work a lot. And um, I think people have gotten away from allowing other people, you know, say correct their kids or get mad if anybody say something to their kids. And 
it's just like you say, it's going to take a community effort going back to God, God first in everything mm-hmm. and, and, and submitting to God. Oh, yes. Yes. Even as a parent, uh, I remember when my son uh, was young, it was very challenging. He was my only son. It was very challenging. He wanted to hang out with kids and that uh, did things or that were allowed to do things that I didn't allow him to do. So it it was challenging. I had to stay on my knees many nights concerning my son, you know, uh, praying to God and teaching him how to pray, Uh, you know, telling him, you're going to have to talk to God. Uh, You're at the age now where God wants to hear from you. You know, you're becoming a young man and you're going to have to learn to pray, get in your word, ask God, what is it that you expect of me? What is it that you want from me? Uh, Because a lot of times, uh, if we don't tell them or guide them spiritually, you know, um, they don't feel there's a need for it. But I was coming up, my parents, you didn't have a choice. Uh, My mom was a a minister's wife. uh, And so I had to go to church. I didn't have the choice. I had to pray. I had to be saved. You know, it wasn't no wearing no pants and all this stuff. And so I had to live a certain way. I had a standards that I had to live by. It's a little different now with the millennials. You just can't force it on them. But through love and through prayer, I feel like we can get there. Right. I think with, I'm not a parent. So it's just me saying from experience being around kids that they, they want to have a voice, but they also like structure because, um, a, a minister friend of mine, she used to be my youth matron coming up. And that it was funny to her that I said it was the structure that drew me to her because like when I went to went to youth group and stuff at church, it was they had rules. Mm-hmm. Now coming up, I was the only child at my grandma's house. I didn't have a lot of rules to be honest. Yeah. And and so when I went to church so it was structure and so I mean I still like going. And I, yeah. I, I think we miss structure. So, you know, the kids do what they want. And I really think, you know, and I say kids, but those younger than me, um, yeah. the generations after me, they just miss structure. And for people like my age that have kids, I feel like they feel like their parents were so strict or whatever that they, they're like, oh, well, I want to be a little bit more lax with my kid. And so mm-hmm. then we get more lax with the generations to come and get away from everything. Cause I'm very funny about, I won't say funny about my, my discernment is very strong. So I don't, if I walk up to somebody, I don't just touch and touchy feely or engage with everything. Cause I've been told more than once, you know, protect your gate. So I'm starting to think about what I watch, what I listen to. And I think, you know, um, this generation is so free spirited. They listen to things. They play all kind of violent games. They 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 smoke and try everything, and so they don't realize just how much that affects them spiritually. That's true. Yeah. And fight about guarding your gates. We through prayer, through fasting, we do. We have to guard our gates, guard our mind. You know, guard our ears. We can't just let just anything go into our ears, you know, our eyes. We can't just watch anything Um, and connect it to God uh, because there are some spirits out there that can connect themselves to you and um, it it will take prayer to get rid of it. Right. So you you, you mentioned um, your grandchildren. Um, If you could decide what the future would look like for them. Name three things or areas of progress you would want to see for them. I would really like to see a time when my grandchildren will be able to go outside and play in the yard and, uh, you know, just enjoy each other playing ball outside in the front yard without uh, the risk of being kidnapped or someone uh, doing something detrimental to them. 
Uh, another area would be education, you know, seeing them graduating. A lot of the millennials now, uh, they would rather, you know, a lot of them are leading more toward just uh, high school education and not going on to college. But I would like to see them, you know, further their educations because it's going to take that and more to get where they're going. Uh, family interaction is another thing because the children nowadays uh, have uh, access to these uh, PS1s or whatever they call these games, Fortnite. <laughs> <laughs> they do not want to come out of their room. You know, they want to stay on the game all day long. They don't want to eat. They don't want to interact. They don't want to talk. They don't want to clean up. So, you know, I would like to see a world, you know, things to get back to where it used to be, where we could sit at the dinner table and eat and discuss our problems. You know, that's where at the dinner table, that's where we used to find out what was going on, you know what our problems were and we were able to tell our parents well you know i don't want to go to school tomorrow because such and such is talking about my hair or you know so we didn't really have the bullying and stuff at the level that we have it at now because we were able to talk about it and our parents didn't mind going up to the school to take care of it but now that you're really talking you know they're playing these games and you know it's a distraction so it's it's causing them to be um, withdrawn and not open up as much to their parents. So I would like to see more family interaction. And, you know, something just came into my spirit when you mentioned about them being withdrawn on the game all the time, not having that same interaction. So when you don't have that social interaction, when you're dealing with because we just talked about the violence and and, and and the gun violence, you don't know how to communicate with somebody else. When yes. you when, when you socially have not been interacting with not even your own family, when you have this stranger, well, when you say stranger, it could be a friend, and y'all are having a disagreement, you don't even know how to handle that because you have spent limited time socializing with other people. That's right. Wow. Other than the people on the game, you know, that they communicate or play with. And I've had the opportunity. I didn't really know much about these games, but I had the opportunity to watch my grandson play uh, one, uh, one evening. And the type of games that are out there, um, it's pretty much violent, violent games. Fortnite, um, a lot of people like to play Fortnite. I know they probably have different types of games. But the one that I saw, it was a bloodbath, uh, shooting and killing. When they weren't shooting and killing, they were robbing banks. And I'm like, you know, I can learn how to rob a bank or how to get away with murder from this game. <laughs> if I stayed on it all day long and a couple of days a week, I could probably get good at it. So, you know, uh, I feel like that, it needs a lot of prayer. Um, we have to really pray for our children concerning these games and the things that are out there because i feel like those spirits are transferable you can what you see what goes into your gates it affects your spirit man and so uh, a lot of this stuff is not good for them and then they wonder why you know the children are packing guns or why it's so easy for them to kill you know or to you know to you to have gun violence and but if you sit there and you've been on these game and you've seen the the murders and the killings and you're pulling the trigger on these games all day long and stuff, I could see where that could affect the, the youth. Right. I, the last game that I that I owned and played was the very first Nintendo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like I don't really engage with the games, but I do know like one of my friends we were trying to shop just for COVID. And her boys had made her so angry. She was like, I'm going to just take the whole game because they got into like a fist fight over the game. She said, this is getting out of hand. Like, you know, and if you're spending, let's say they're spending 80% of their time on this game, you're right. They're going to feel like, oh, I can do this and not even think about that murder is murder. Robbing a bank will have you sitting up in jail, the prison for life, because you don't see that part on the game. 
And That's I laughed right. because the the you said how to get away with murder. That's my show. Um, <laughs> and I would watch it. And then one day I was like, you know, I'm sitting here thinking like they, they got all these ideas lined out what you can do. If somebody is only feeding themselves this, and not able to, because once you feed yourself so much negative stuff, and if you're, if you're not feeding yourself the word at all, you're going to, oh my gosh. And if the enemy has your mind, he has you. That's true. And I saw it, uh, an article on television a while back where they were considering game playing the next mental illness, that it was actually a mental illness. Um that's contributed from, you know, playing the games. And I could see that. I could actually see that because if what you're feeding your spirit uh, goes into your spirit, I could see that causing depression and anxiety and, you know, different things, different types of mental illnesses. A lot of kids, they, they have became angry. Um, some have even became violent, uh, not wanting to go to school staying up all night, not wanting, you know, losing sleep. So the next day, of course, you're not going to want to go to school because you've been up playing the game all night. And then the parents, a lot of times the parents uh, don't know what to do to reach those, the, you know, their own children because right. they've been on these games and the um, their personalities have changed. And so a lot of them are seeking counseling and therapy for their children because of the game plan okay. um, and mental health things you know now um one of the things that um i uh me and my therapist discussed is about how um social media you know how people will like your comments and love your comments and things like that how people are affected by that that yeah. some people are addicted to that, you know, and um, I found that to be, you know, at the time she was saying that, I was like, yeah, I'm not bothered by that. But then I, I started thinking about, am I moved by that? And so I tried to feed myself less social media because, you know, we post, we post for people to read it. And, yeah. and you know, yeah. And those games can be very addictive, just like a drug. Like yes, that is so true. Because drugs change your mood. Yes. And and from what I hear about the Fortnite, you spend money to get certain stuff. Yes. And and I don't, you know, if the parent is working, you know, and they're trying to let them do things so they can rest. I, I, I just the struggle is real for parents. Lord. It is. I have heard parents say that they have actually been notified from their bank account that a child has spent $50, $100. I know my grandson did. He spent $50 for a ga on the game, and it came, you know, it came out of his dad's account. And so these kids, are they're, they're trying to get those to the next level however they can. So you have to um, make sure that you put some things in place to make sure that they're not able to rob you uh, because, <laughs> or because yeah. of the game. Whew. And I'm just thinking about yeah. if, they're, if they're playing a game and not thinking about what they're, how much they're spending or they don't care, if some of yeah. them don't care about what they're spending out of their parents' account, what does that teach them or mentally set them up uh, as uh, an adult? Like... I'll, I'll do what I want and, and, and do what I need to do. And it doesn't matter what I do to, to get what I want. Like, whew, like, I don't know. I'm just, it, it, it spiritually is just really, you know, I don't know. We got on the game thing and it's really, really got me thinking about these, the minds of these young people. Yes. So one of the things that um, you recently started was a prayer group on um, Facebook. Tell the listeners a little bit about the prayer group and what made it motivated you to create it. Well, uh, because my mom was a prayer warrior and that was kind of passed down to me. Um, I, like I said, I've always had um, a need for prayer in my life. And so um, as I was working for hospice, 
um, for 12 years, I had to pray a whole lot. You know, I had to pray for patients. I had to pray for patients' families that were grieving at the time of death or during the transition. And it really uh, took me to another level in my prayer life. And uh, there was a, a social worker that I was friends with on the job. Uh, I would pray with her occasionally. And one day I was praying for her and she told me, she said, you know, you should start a prayer group. And I was like, well, I would like to, but I didn't know how to go about doing it. So she said, I could build your website. She was so excited about it. And it just really, I, I mean, I was excited. I was just overwhelmed. And we did that day. She set up my website for me. And uh, I gave birth uh, May of 2014 to what I call TLC, Touching Lives Through Christ Prayer Group. And uh, I started off with 60 members that I invited um, to be members of the group. I also had a few of them that um, I um, assigned as administrators to help me with the group, to help me keep track of it. We wanted to make sure that just anybody couldn't come on because, you know, you have people out there that are non-believers, atheists, that will come in and try to tear your group up. So I wanted to make sure that we took care of that area. And also, um, I um, at this time, as of August of 2020, I have 105 members. Uh, the pray, we welcome people to come on and request prayer. They can uh, post prayers. Um, post inspirations testimonies uh there's a lot of times um we find out people that uh in the community that have cancer or different illnesses or whatever and they're asking for prayer maybe even on facebook and i may put it on the prayer group so that the prayer warriors can help to pray for them so it's definitely a great tool you know for you mentioned um that a couple of times that you you work for a hospice. Mm -hmm. I we worked together for a short while. I tried to do nursing care, like my mom did, and I sucked at it. <laughs> <laughs> it just it just wasn't like I I had an attachment issue. Like when the resident died, it just it broke me. I just I just that, I couldn't do it. Yes. Yeah, how yeah. do you how do you because hospice is during their last moments. How do you do that? Well, I was there when my mom passed, uh, when my grandmother passed, several family members. I did not know that it was a ministry of or something that God wanted me to do until I stayed with my mom for a whole week and watched her die, watch her transition and pass. At the time of my mom's uh, passing, uh, she was taking her last breath. And all of a sudden, I was praying with her, and I felt this force come into the room like nothing I had ever felt in my life. But I knew right then that I was in the very presence of God. My hands, went, as my mom was taking her last breath, my hands went up in the air, and I began to praise God and to help to usher her into the presence of the Lord. And at that moment, I knew that it was more to it than just standing at the bedside of someone that was going. I knew that it was a spiritual journey, that it took God. And as I told one of my patients that I took care of with before he passed, I told him, you know, he was so ready to go. I said, you know, God, he loves you so much that he will not send anybody to get you. He's going to come himself. And the reason why I said that is because that day, in the hospital with my mother, I felt the very presence of God. I knew that it was God that had came to usher my mom into heaven. And so uh, that just kind of stayed with me. It was like a, a drug, a high, that I kept looking for that feeling. Uh, and so when I went into work for hospice, each time I was with a patient, I felt the presence of God and I mean, it was just so awesome. It was something I cannot describe. And uh, but I didn't know God was ushering me into a ministry and uh, it became a part of my life. And then people began to call on me, people that didn't even know me, but had heard of me 
uh, to come and uh, come to their homes to take care of their family members as they were transitioning or dying. And so it has truly been a blessing to me. Not all the time I felt like I was giving to them, but a lot of times at those bedsides, those people are angels to me. A lot of them were given back to me. It felt like I was in the very presence of the angelic beings. These were angels already in transition. Wow. So it's a beautiful thing. That had to to be, first of all, an a, a amazing experience to be with your mom during her final moments. Yes. Yes, and it was. To, to really witness the power of God and, and oh. And all of his awesomeness. I tell you, I've been in church all my life, but I have never felt his presence like I did that day, the day my mom left. It was on a Sunday at 12 noon, and I will never forget that feeling ever. It was almost like the day I got saved. You know, you never forget that day. Right. But never forget the day when Jesus came for my mom. And see, that is that that that's an amazing testimony because not only did you get to witness her final moments, and and uh, and, and God come to you and you find your purpose here, but yeah. also, I, I I really believe that when we to lose is to gain, because yeah. although you suffered a loss, that loss helped you help so many people. Yeah, and and, and it's just. It's awesome how God works. It really, it, it really is. So, yes, it is. um, we're we're coming to the end of our conversation, and, and I have so many people that listen, um, all over the United States and a couple of countries abroad. So, will you do me the honor and the listeners of closing us out with a prayer for those listening? Sure. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come to you asking that you would just continue to cover us with your blood, God. Oh, God, we ask that you would just touch this nation, God. Touch the government, God. Touch our president, God. In the name of Jesus, oh, God, we ask that you would help us to be able to see things from your eyes, God, and not from our own. God, I ask that you would help to continue to lead your people closer to you, God. Oh, God, help us to be able to worship you the more, God. In the name of Jesus, oh, God, I ask that you would heal our millennials, the young people, God. Heal their minds, God. Heal their hearts, God, and direct them to you, God. Oh, God, we just thank you, God, for the many things that you're doing and the many things that you're continuing to do, God. We're going to ask all these things in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen.